Okay, ma'am, should we start? Uh, yes, it's, I think it's the time to start. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So, uh, very good morning, uh, Ms. Christy Harrington, ma'am, and a very good evening to one and all present here. I'm Abhijit Mori, and I'm taking this opportunity to warmly welcome you all to the third lecture of the special lecture series on topic mediation and conciliation recent development organized by Maharashtra National Law University in association with the Family Court Bar Association. The Maharashtra National Law University Mumbai is one of the premier law institution in India. The university was established in year 2014 and it started its first academic India in year 2015. The university disseminates advanced legal knowledge under the able guidance and mentorship of university's chancellor, Honorable Justice D. Y. Chandrachud, and under the able leadership of his Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Dilip Puke. Now, Family Bar, uh, Family Court Bar Association is a professional body of lawyer that promote conciliation and secure the speedy settlement of dispute relating to marriage and family affairs, aiding the judges in the administration of justice. The purpose and aim of establishing the family court is to protect and preserve the institution of marriage and to promote the welfare of children and provide the settlement of dispute by conciliation and the advocates of Family Court Bar Association are really working hard in order to achieve that goal. Mediation and conciliation are the techniques that help to resolve the dispute and disagreement between the transacting party by arriving the amicable settlement through negotiation mm -hmm. and discussion. It provides the speedy disposal of trial, economic settlement of dispute, and it is time saving. In order to understand the recent development in mediation, MNLU Mumbai, in association with the Family Court Bar Association, organized this special lecture series on the topic mediation and conciliation recent development. Now, many of you already know uh, Honorable Christy Harrington, ma'am, but uh, let me do this honor to introduce her again. Miss Christy became the youngest circuit court judge and only one of the six female circuit judge in the state of South Carolina in 2008, when she was anonymously elected by the state legislation. She was appointed to the Governor's Task Force on Violence Against Women as the sole circuit judge working to reduce the number of assault and deaths of a woman in the state. In 2018, Christie retired from the bench after serving two terms. She is a certified Supreme Court mediator and arbitrator, owning her own alternate dispute resolution practice, Christie Harrington Dispute Resolution. She is honored to be on American Arbitration Association Judicial Panel and the member of Arbitral Woman. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, and we are awaiting for your third lecture. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Can you see my PowerPoint now? Uh, you have shared different, uh, your uh, uh, desktop, ma'am. You have shared different things. <clears throat> How did we just had this? Uh, yes, ma'am. If you could yeah. uh, again share, and uh, this time, if you could click on PPT. Uh, yes, ma'am. Now it is visible. There we go. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> right. Thank you. It's uh, it's early here in South Carolina on a Friday, and I uh, had a long night uh, teaching. Uh, my law students last night, so I'm excited that the PowerPoint is working today. I'm, I'm sorry, but can I just interrupt? I can't hear you very clearly, Christy. Can you just adjust your audio settings? Yes. So Thank is that you. better? Is that better? Good. Um, I love it. And please just jump in and let me know. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, uh, again, I, last uh, our last session was very interactive, and I'm hoping to have that session, uh, this, that level of interaction, uh, this session. So please either put uh, something in the chat tool, and Mr. Moray will ask the question. It's hard to see uh, the, the chat tool as I'm, I've got my PowerPoint out, but or just unmute yourself and ask a question. So it's, uh, I know it's later in the evening for y'all. Uh, uh, 
Uh, you're not audible, ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to share a little humor right uh, this morning. Uh, so uh, the mediator said I might be too late to mediate. The parties are already engaging in their own form of dispute resolution. So what I what I want you to think about today is when uh, when do you want your mediator to show up? And what do you want your mediator to be doing when he or she does show up? So just to go over some of our previous sessions, we defined what mediation is and more importantly, what it isn't. A reminder that the mediator controls the process, the parties control the outcome. How important it is for the mediator to set the table, and uh, that includes the preparation before the mediation and establishing the ground rules before the parties uh, get to their opening uh, statements. Excuse me, ma'am. Can I make a request? Uh, I think today your voice is not uh, that clear or it is not that much audible. Uh, okay, is there any yes, setup that? Yes, I wonder what, uh, again, I haven't done anything different. So let me see what I can do to make it more audible. We're just not doing too well today, are we? <laughs> you know, Christy, it seems like you are at, uh, far away from the mic. It seems very distant. And and so is this any better? No, it's not better. <laughs> hey, um, hold on. I'm really second. sorry, but want to hear you clearly, so we can't hear yes, you. Yes, and I want you to hear me clearly. So let's. Um, is this any better? Sorry, not better. Not better. You know, it's not that you can't be heard, but uh, there is definitely something wrong. Uh, like only one microphone is working, uh, so you know it is not that clear voice. If we, in case we could make any arrangement, let's see. Or else we can proceed. Yeah. So let's see what uh, we can do. Or do you want <clears throat> me to call in, Mr. Warren? Would that be better? Uh, sorry, ma'am, I didn't hear that. What did you say? Would it be better if I used a phone number to call in, or, or can you hear me better now? Uh, we do can we can hear you now, ma'am. We can hear you, but uh, still, what we have observed in the previous class, your voice was very clear and way it was loud, so it was convenient to hear. But now it is not coming that way. All right. Well, <clears throat> let's. Um... You know, Christy, we really need to train. We need to train to hear you. You're straining to hear me. Yes, well, yes. Gonna, I'm going to speak as loud as we can. I don't. Uh, I don't know what else at this point that I can do. Um, I can leave and come back. Would that yeah, be... maybe that is an option. That is an option. Okay, let me let me do that. I'll be right back. Great, great. Thank you. Abhijit, I'm sorry I spelled called yes. you out as Abhishek. Sorry. No, no issue, ma'am. Sorry. We will wait for mm -hmm. Abhijit, her voice was clearly not audible. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. we, we do can hear her voice, but it was not that clear. We have to listen carefully. So that is yes. what I observed, but I thought it might be only problem from my side. That's why I no, didn't. And hear. I noticed it more clearly because I can hear you very, very, very clearly. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Let okay. Me, um, once she joined, we will get the clarity she must be having okay. mobile phone on table that's why that is also create some kind of noise okay.
ओके ओके थैंक यू हेलो मैम अनम्यूट यूर सेल्फ मैम यू हैव म्यूटेड योर सेल्फ Is better? Yes, ma'am. I think it is better. <laughs> All right. So, again, please just let me know. I'm, I'm on the. Uh, I've called in, so just let me know if there's um, anything else. Now that... we can uh, clearly hear you, ma'am. There is no okay, issue. Okay, great. All right. So, reviewing the previous sessions. And so we'll just talk on some of the highlights. Um, again, um, here's another joke. Uh, so who wants to be the first to stick his neck out? And so sometimes it's really important when you're starting to break the ice, especially when you get a little off track, maybe your uh, PowerPoint isn't working or you're having trouble connecting. Um, a little humor sometimes is helpful. So um, having uh, some tips like that or just some uh, silly jokes to tell as long as uh, they're going to be understood. So we talked a lot uh, last session about difficult clients. And so really it is important um, that the um, the in your mediation brief to the mediator or as the mediator that you're requesting some some heads up about these difficult clients. And I, we talked about some techniques to use when you're getting to an impasse. And again, keeping in mind things like what are the pending issues and what has prevented resolution prior to this mediation. We talk a lot about reframing the issue. So when clients become, uh, the litigants become entrenched in their own issue, again, having them, why do you feel that's the only option? And remember, it is not the parties against the parties, it's the parties of, of trying to resolve this issue. Having each litigant talk to you as the mediator, or if you are representing that client, why their offer is reasonable, why their position is reasonable. I think it's, again, based upon some of our questions from last session, asking the party, what is their purpose for resolution? Sometimes you'll find when you're talking about uh, entrenched parties that the parties don't really want to resolve the issue. Sometimes a party wants and, and likes the drama of litigation or the attention or something of, of that nature. So asking the party, like, why do you want to settle this case? Why is it important for you to reach an agreement about these issues. 
getting to that very crux of the issue will help you as the mediator or if you are the advocate to understand why that person is at the table or maybe why they're getting ready to leave. When you have gotten to this point of entrenchment, again, that we talked last time about, this is really an opportunity for the parties to come together and think about collaborative solutions. If the settlement was going to work, if that particular dollar amount was going to work, if that offer was going to be accepted, it would have been done earlier in the day at mediation or likely before you even got to mediation. So this is the point really where you need a mediator to start being creative in solutions, start thinking outside the box and say, really, I love this the idea, the coming together and both sides working, uh, putting the pieces together to create something new. Common questions, what does it look like again tomorrow if you don't settle? How can I, as the mediator, help you resolve this issue? Sometimes you're just gonna have to call that behavior out and say, I understand uh, it is not gonna resolve today. Sometimes changing the location. So if you're in uh, the courthouse or council's conference room or your mediator's office, having, uh, taking the parties out, you know, maybe taking one litigant, if you're doing family court, maybe taking the husband out and walking around the block or just walking uh, to get a, a drink from the vending machine or something like that helps to get that person away from the table. I find some of my best ideas come when I'm going for my morning walk and just really focused on the movement. And sometimes that will be enough to get that individual away from the, from the table and again, helping you. There's numerous studies um, on gender discussions and um, you know, we talk a lot about men having uh, in the U.S. having um, conversations, in, in more uh, in-depth conversations in the car and that's because you're side to side and not face to face. So understanding some, some dynamics of how to communicate and what is effective communication. So again, that's why walking, uh, because you're side to side um, and so shoulder to shoulder. So maybe that's a way to get your um, litigants to start thinking about things in, in different um, ideas and solutions. Again, making sure in this leads again back to that preparation before mediation starts, having the parties buy in, having the parties understand what mediation is, is so important. And then again, if it doesn't settle today, what will that look like? Is it the case going to be on a docket? Are you going to the next stage in litigation? What is going to happen if this issue doesn't resolve today? And again, why don't you want it to settle? Or what's the purpose of having this settlement? So maybe you've done all these things. Maybe you've, uh, you know, you are the advocate and your mediator has done everything that you think he or she can do, but you're still at an impasse. What do you do? Our, our rules in South Carolina, again, it is the duty to, term, to timely determine if mediation is not viable an impasse exists or that the mediation should end. And all of these things are, are different uh, ways of looking at them. Just because the mediation is not viable or it should end doesn't mean an impasse exists. So what's an impasse? It really means simply that the parties 
are not going to reach agreement. And so an impasse, if an impasse exists, the mediator can make that determination. I think sometimes uh, there's been, when I go, you know, I've separated the room, the, the parties into separate rooms, and I go in and I convey the offer and we're talking about the pros and cons, the risks of that offer. The parties, that particular party may say, I'm done. And simply saying I'm done does not mean an impasse exists. And so being able as the mediator or at, and making sure that your mediator continues to work this process. Keeping in mind, of course, that mediation is voluntary and you cannot force any settlement, but keeping in mind that an impasse truly means when your, your parties are so far apart that there is really no reasonable expectation that you'll close that gap. I, you know, I'll have sometimes in a car wreck, a personal injury case, the first offer by the plaintiff might be a million dollars and the defense's response might be $5. That's not an impasse unless you know as the mediator that neither party is going to budge. That's a huge gap to fill, right? And a lot of movement, but if the parties are there in good faith to resolve this and you can get each side to reevaluate their position, then you can get past this impasse. So you've worked really hard and you have an agreement. What do you do with that agreement? The requirement is that under our rules in South Carolina, that the party shall, they have to, we have to, reduce it to writing. And that's before the adjournment of the mediation. That's before we all say, I'm tired, I'm going to take a break, we're going to go get lunch. Before you say, we're done, there needs to be a writing. And the attorneys need to sign it. I think if you've got parties at the table, the parties need to sign it too, but our rules just require that the attorneys sign it. So how do you do this? So I always take a draft, just a draft sample template to the mediation so that all the terms are contained in the agreement. This is really what it can be as detailed a template as you want to take with you, but this gives you an idea of just some of the terms that can be placed into the settlement agreement. I take, of course, my laptop with me to the mediation, or if we're on Zoom, then it's easy for me to uh, help write the settlement agreement. Some mediators may want you as the counsel, as the advocate, to write the agreement, but I do find that having this very basic template, if the attorneys are not prepared, really does help. And so it can be as simple as, so that would be um, the case caption, the parties involved, and I just fill in the blank. And so I might, if I'm um, just getting them to sign it and we anticipate or, or think that there's gonna be really a more formal agreement written or a stipulation of dismissal, then this this will suffice under the rules. And so we put the date, uh, who your mediator was, who, who was present at the mediation, was the plaintiff there, was the defendant there. Uh, also in uh, personal injury cases, the uh, adjuster has to be there, and the adjuster there for the insurance company, the person with the authority, the really the checkbook to help settle this case. And so this, we work and put uh, the agreement that some will be paid to the plaintiff, um, and then who is going to sign the release, who's going to file the dismissal paperwork with the court, 
who is going to pay for the mediation cost who's going to pay for their attorney's fees. And then I always leave one just for any other terms. So maybe um, there was um, a post put um, on the Better Business Bureau website or a Yelp review or something derogatory that uh, the um, plaintiff had said about the defendant. Maybe the defendant wants that renewed. So you can articulate that. And this is where I oftentimes, if we're if if I'm feeling like we're close, but the the parties need a nudge, maybe I'll pull this settlement agreement out and ask the parties, what do you think else we could put or you would be comfortable requiring or putting as part of this settlement agreement? Because if this case, this particular hypothetical case between the plaintiff and the defendant in a personal injury case did not resolve at mediation, the jury is going to make a determination. And really all the jury is able to do is award a dollar amount. They're not going to be awarding uh, mediation fees. They're not going to be awarding attorney's fees. And in that example that I just talked about with a, a bad review, the jury is not going to be able to make that part of their, their verdict. So when I talk about, you know, when I have the parties tell me what the issues are, and most importantly, their purpose for resolution, this sometimes in black and white helps move the case towards a resolution. So rule eight, confidentiality, and, and again, you really want to be stressing confidentiality all throughout the mediation. And that really is something as an advocate, you should be encouraging your uh, clients to uh, why a reason why they should engage in mediation. So any mediation disclosed, any communication disclosed during mediation shall be confidential. So what I tell parties when I'm going through and before they give their opening statements, when I'm doing my mediator introduction, I let them know that anything they tell me with or without their attorney is, is confidential and shall remain confidential. So if the case doesn't settle, no, the other party cannot call me to court as a witness to testify as to well, wasn't it true, Ms. Harrington, that during the mediation, they were willing to settle this case for $20,000? That's not allowed under the rules for confidentiality. So having this confidentiality discussion with your clients before and really having the confidentiality agreement I think this is one, you know, the voluntariness of mediation is paramount, but also this concept of confidentiality really makes mediation so beneficial. That what is shared, you know, this brainstorming idea when we talk about let's reframe the issues, all of that is confidential. So make sure that in your agreement to mediate that you read that fully and that the mediator explains what the what that means and how that is going to impact your client. I think a lot of times we again as attorneys and people that are engaged now in litigation, they know this is an adversarial system and they are hesitant to share everything. No, having that trust and that rapport and so again, confidentiality, I start talking about confidentiality right after I tell them who I am, that these are confidential proceedings, anything you share with me will remain confidential unless I am told otherwise. So when I break the parties into separate rooms, into caucus, I remind them what you tell me, I cannot share with the other party and back and forth unless you tell me otherwise. 
this really helps to build that trust and rapport because the parties need to trust the mediator so that they can share these good and bad things, right? One of the reasons why a party may not want to go to court is because some negative information may be released. So I found this case and um, I thought it did a lovely, had a lovely explanation about um, that mediation proceedings are totally confidential, unlike proceedings in court, which are conducted openly in the public gaze. What I think is also really nice about this is that when you as an advocate or when you are mediating a case, this is a reason why uh, one of those kind of intangibles, why people should mediate and not go into court. I think it's, you know, we forget how all of our court proceedings with few exceptions are open to the public. And while you may not have done anything bad, uh, we, do you really want to share everything in public? And you know, especially if you've got a business concern, maybe you don't want uh, the public to know that this particular instance happened or something of that nature. So keeping this in mind that um, how that mediator's report also goes to the court. I thought that your Supreme Court did a lovely job is in um, that the mediator should write only one sentence in the report and send it to the court and say mediation has been unsuccessful. Do not write anything which was discussed, proposed, or done during the mediation proceedings. So I thought this it was a very short case but very well written and I thought gave a really nice outline about what uh, your confidentiality concern should be. So this is what our mediator's report looks like. This is our proof of ADR, proof of all, uh, alternative dispute resolution. And as you can see, it covers mediation, non-binding arbitration and binding arbitration. And so again, this is a form, you find it on our uh, court's website after you complete it, after you completed your ADR, the mediator fills it out and files this with the court. So th the rule, uh, this form changed uh, at the end of 2021, it used to have a, 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 a couple of lines for the mediator to give uh, an update on um, what happened in the mediation. And so I, I thought that was interesting that India back in, that y'all back in 2010 knew that we shouldn't be writing on our reports what happened in the mediation. So this is just a very basic form. Uh, one of the duties of the um, mediator has to be uh, filed uh, within 10 days. You've got to file it with the clerk of court in that county and make sure that the attorneys know. Again, simply you are letting the court know what ADR form was used and who was there, the plaintiffs, the defendant, the lawyers, again, representatives for the insurance. In a family court matter, do you have a guardian ad litem for the children, somebody who is there representing the children's cases? Do you have an expert? Did an expert come in? Usually more um, common in the binding or non-binding arbitrations, although I have had in my larger construction defect cases, experts come in to give their opinion so that everyone could hear. Um, and those are cases that have multiple parties, uh, multiple defendants, or sometimes multiple plaintiffs as well in a class action type form 
when an apartment complex or condo, something of that nature, um, there was some defective construction. As a result, question number four, as a result, this case should be considered fully settled by consent judgment, voluntary judgment, and who's going to fill out those paperwork, partially settled or at an impasse. And so this is where the mediator makes that decision. Uh, and so going, um, having all of that information, and this should be done within 10 days. I like to get it done the day, like when I come back to my office, I fill out the paperwork and get this right to the court especially if the case is settled so that case can be removed from the docket. Again, you sign it and date it and send it to the clerk of court. This, so, you know, again, um, it, it acknowledges, this form acknowledges that cases are going to go through an mediation or non-binding arbitration and may reach an impasse. And so keeping that in mind, I, you know, early on uh, as a mediator, I considered it a failure if we wouldn't settle or we had reached an impasse. Don't ever think of that uh, as a mediation that does not result in uh, settlement at that mediation as a failure. I have found uh, that even those cases that don't settle at mediation, that maybe I've declared an impasse, that through a little more work or continued mediation, <clears throat> either by phone or Zoom, that we can move it from an impasse to fully settled. And that really takes some work again on the mediator's part. Uh, I had a mediation last week that I have, uh, you know, it did not settle. I could tell that there was room for movement, but we had worked all day and the frustration level was, was I could tell the plaintiff was, was frustrated by the system and the process. And so I said, why don't we uh, adjourn and I'll be in touch in a few days and we'll see where we can can move. And so um, the the case is settled, um, even though we didn't settle it at the initial mediation. And so again, if I knew that it was going to settle, I have 10 days to file it, maybe I would wait and then I can check it as fully settled. But there is no, don't get so concerned that at that time, the case doesn't settle. And I think that's where sometimes mistakes can get made and we can move this from a voluntary process into a process in which uh, one party who may have uh, a little more bargaining power um, could force a settlement. So again, having a mediator that is monitoring and, and aware of what is happening, then uh, that's really helpful. Mr. Ward, do we have any questions? Uh, if anyone want any, uh, if anyone want to ask any question, or if you have any question for ma'am. I saw some people turn their cameras on. I didn't know. Does that mean they have a question? Uh, Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, sir. Please. Yes. Yes. Uh, see, there are two, three forms of ADR. So how do we compare ADR with other things? And why ADR is superior to oh, arbitration and other forms of ADR? Uh, so the various forms of ADR, we're going to talk about, uh, so there's arbitration, uh, and I've, I've got, uh, I've got a question. I've got one of those. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to talk about the different types of, of ADR, but we are focused just today, uh, in this series on mediation. 
So we'll talk in the difference today between mediation and conciliation. And I'll talk a little bit about mediation arbitration, uh, that, that hybrid model. Uh, I think mediation uh, is superior uh, because the parties get to reach a voluntary settlement that they are involved, the parties are involved in reaching their own conclusion. Instead of having a judge find it or a jury reach a verdict. Um, and so I, that's why I think mediation, the way that I've described it is, is the, is a better form, especially if you're trying to preserve relationships and especially in the family court setting when you have a dissolution of marriage especially if you have children involved you do want to protect that relationship so this arbitration or or um you know where somebody else is making that decision especially in the context of of children um does not uh, preserve the relationships. And I think that's one of the things that in India is the, this preservation of marriage and relationships. I hope that answered your question. Yes, just one more point. Yes. And one more point is in case of med uh, mediation, all your strengths and weaknesses are disclosed. So both the parties are exposing each other. So whether if the mediation does not succeed, whether these things would not be misused later on. So that's a that's a, a comment. That's a great question. Um, and so that is always one of the concerns about mediation and this confidentiality issue. Um, and so having getting the parties to agree on what confidentiality is, what is um, communication for mediation, and that it, it cannot be used in any form later is, is really important to get, to allay that concern, right? And some of the complaints or um, challenges about using mediation is, so is this just an opportunity to engage in discovery that made that I'm going to be able to use somehow later? And so this is where it is important to have this trust with your mediator mm -hmm. and to get the parties at the table to agree, this is the benefit. This is a benefit to us. The process is going to, if we work the process, it's a benefit to my client. It's a benefit uh, to the larger relationship. But that, that always is a concern is if this does not resolve, if the parties cannot reach a voluntarily voluntary settlement what is going to happen next and so this is a case um, to talk about your point is that once the parties uh, what happens if the case settles and then there's something that we need to do like we have to enforce the settlement agreement in this case talks about um, and the also the may versus may is a is a, cust a domestic case a uh, divorce case what happens when we have to use the document in conjunction with someone else maybe not we're not talking about litigation anymore but now we've got to use them because uh, one of the parties did not comply with the settlement agreement. Do all of those things then uh, come back into play? In this case, uh, our, our Supreme Court told us in South Carolina that the rule is designed to protect the communications during mediation and to protect the process because our Supreme Court realizes how important the process is. But anything in conjunction with the settlement is not in the course of mediation. So 
I, I talk about this case, especially when I'm talking to South Carolina lawyers about, again, you then, even in the settlement agreement, you need to make sure that you have completed that settlement agreement because you're not, again, going to be able to bring the mediator in to talk about what happened in the mediation. So I hope that answered your question. I've got a little bit later in the presentation, I've got um, some discussions about uh, conciliation Hello. versus mediation and arbitration. Christy, madam. Hello. Yes. Yes. Uh, good, e good evening, Shashi Nair, this one. Say that one more time. Shashi Nair, this one. Your co-host. The president of uh, Family Bar Association. Well, hello. Thank you. I hello. hope you're enjoying the yeah. presentation. Yeah. I, I, I was with you. Madam, this... Uh, uh, two questions he put it just I was hearing. Uh, the first question, actually, there is a confusion to the lawyer. Actually, ADR is a vast subject. Mediation is a part from it. Arbitration, conciliation, mediation, logadalat. Indian, uh, ad, uh, 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 Indian alternative dispute resolution is handling all these things. From there, uh, as last I discussed, mediation is the most democratic form, which is the advanced form of the ADR. First thing. Second question he put is the, uh, everything is disclosing before the mediator. Suppose that terms of that secrets can be disclosed in a mediation or in, the, in an adjudication. So the answer is that, sir, uh, it is a totally secret process. There is an oath by the mediator. Whatever disclosing in mediation process, that cannot be used in an adjudication or that cannot be used as an evidence. And if a mediation is failed, Madam uh, rightly pointed out, the wedding is only, only the mediation is not worked out. There cannot be any explanation that is the beauty as well as the, that is the confidentiality of the process of mediation. Indian mediation rules also framed in 2006. It is very specific in Indian law. Mediation, whatever disclosing, even any commitment before entering in an agreement in a written form of compromise deed, nothing can be considered as a evidence by either of the party. That is a very clear in the mediation rule. That's all. Nice. And, Thank, uh, you. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Thank Madam, you for the I answer. Nee, but uh, yeah. this is Mr. not about confidentiality. This is not about yes. secrecy. If I expose my weaknesses, then the, the subject will remain confidential. But in the litigation, I will use that information for my benefit. Sir, uh, uh, it is slightly I am deferring with you uh -huh. because mediation there are different steps. There is a step that if any confidential things that should be only disclosed to the mediator in the absence of the other party. Acha, okay, that is the right thing. So, that is that okay. I was not and knowing. Yeah, that should okay. be tell the mediator first anything legal or anything confidential should be discussed in secret and in a joint discussion it should be only in the settlement sense nothing against the negatives of the thing that is very oh. specific in the mediation process acha acha got it got it huh? okay and uh, thank you and uh, thank you Madam, uh, i given some question to abhijit he will share to you that is basically about the uh, adjudicated mediation and the trained uh, advocate mediators and the judge's role in mediation as well as the advantages of the retired judges that questions you can dealt in a separate uh, time or separate uh, angle i given the question i shared with mr abhijit it can be worked out uh, your section is going very well i am a part of it actually 
right now i was busy with some other activities but today i was there please proceed you are clearing so many things especially the international arena where the mediation is working you are uh, very authentic as well as very thorough it is very informative to us thank you so much please study thank you i thank you so much and i think that was a really good tip as well and again trusting your mediator if there's something that you don't want to reveal to the other party have that conversation in what we call caucus right so where you separate them the current trend in um, domestic litigation in is the parties don't ever go to they're never at this at the table together and so the mediator goes from from room to room and so the strategy is not discussed uh, and so the mediator only uses those um, those things that are revealed that are potentially damaging if one uh, the opposing counsel or opposing party says that's okay to reveal it or in the context of um, you know, helping the parties realize why this case is, is right for mediation and settlement. And so, again, this is one of those things for mediation. You can really, by being uh, upfront and helping prepare your mediator as to uh, what you do and don't want to share, then this really can help move and facilitate settlement. So we talked about virtual and, and so really I wanna go um, just to, to talk about as a reminder how to have a successful mediation, making sure that your case is ready to mediate, making sure your client is ready to mediate, making sure your mediator is ready to mediate your case. And so all of those things we've been, we've been talking about, we, there's, again, there's kind of a sweet spot in some cases about when it should be ready to mediate. And that's, that's a case by case uh, discussion in personal injury cases, maybe you want to wait and do a little more discovery. Maybe you don't want to wait um, because you know that for you to do discovery in this case, it's going to cost your client a substantial amount of money. Maybe you don't want to mediate right away uh, in a family court matter, in a, in a dissolution of marriage because Maybe the parties are going to counseling or something of that nature. We have talked all through the presentations about getting your client ready to mediate. And this is really a, a different type of conversation than getting your client ready to litigate. Getting your client ready to go to the court, to be cross-examined, uh, to talk to the judge, those are all different conversations than you need to have with your client on mediation, right? And so maybe you, you want to have that conversation differently. Maybe your client, you know your client cannot sit in the room or uh, with opposing counsel and uh, the opposing party. Maybe the, there needs to be some time and space between the events and this mediation. Helping your mediator get ready to mediate this case is crucial to a successful mediation. And I hope throughout you're picking up some tips, if you are a mediator, how to be a better mediator. And if you are an advocate, how to help your mediator successfully mediate your case. So knowing that you know, we've talked about, it's important, does your mediator know the law? Um, are they, have they read the case brief that you've submitted? Having a technology test run, even though 
Uh, Mr. Moore and I got on earlier today. There was still some technology issues. So make sure that you have this backup plan. What's going to happen if your Zoom fails? Are you going to be able to pick up a phone quickly? So let's, anyway, because there was some discussion. So I pulled this. Um, just a difference between mediation and conciliation. I am very familiar with mediation. I know of conciliation, but that is not a term that we use, uh, particularly in South Carolina, in litigation uh, or alternative dispute resolution situations. So I found, um, you know, for, I found this graphic and I thought it was a lovely kind of compare and contrast. What I think is really important is for us to look at the difference between being a facilitator as a mediator and a, an evaluator as a mediator, providing solutions, putting yourself into the, uh, into the settlement agreement. So there's different types of mediation. There's um, different styles, different types. And so uh, we're going to talk briefly before the end of our session today about the difference between facilitative and evaluative. And so we at the top is more of an evaluative where the attorney is there and is injecting himself or herself and giving his opinion about the case. The bottom photo is let's work together. Let let the parties um, work together on their solution, and the mediator is merely there to facilitate. Facilitate facilitated mediation focuses on the process, and you've heard me talk about mediation is all about the process. As a mediator, you're there to control the process. You're not there to to control the outcome. You don't provide suggestions or evaluations. And this is where we get open discussion and those light bulb moments where the parties are coming up with uh, un, uh, solutions to the problem. Most of the time probably is going to be spent in a joint session. All the parties are going to be at the table in that, like in that previous picture. Um, so what's some of those uh, negotiation tools, right, that you may need to break a stalemate. Um, and so this is where you know, the mediator may decide, I need to use another tool and I'm going to, to shift into evaluative uh, mediation. There, it, it's not that the mediation changes in anything. It's the way that the mediator is going to approach the problem. And uh, so in this type of mediation, in this style, the mediator acts more like a judge. And um, I find that uh, some of my mediation, uh, when I get hired, that's what they want me to do. They want, to, they call me judge. They want the parties to know that I have the authority uh, as a judge and I can help them come up with some solutions. So knowing your own personal style as a mediator or knowing who your mediator is in the style, there's a lot of times I'll move back and forth between the two styles. And that's where it you really need a mediator who understands a whole host of issues, right? Not just the legal consequences, but also uh, has some really good communication styles and is understanding what's happening within the parties. So this is where the mediator begins to involve him or herself more into the process, offering solutions to the conflict. The mediator may say, you know, in a, uh, in a construction defect case, maybe your element, you can, you're you not going to be able to prove this. In a breach of contract, maybe that contract was not valid, and so you're really going to have a hard time 
presenting that that fact. That's a weakness in your case. And so having someone else, this neutral third party, that that the parties that the litigants see as somebody similar to a judge, somebody an expert in this area. So I find you know what I like to do is let the parties uh, help me uh, facilitate their solution. But sometimes when I, I'm sensing an impasse is coming and I ask that question, what is this going to look like if you don't settle today? I can offer some input because I've sat and presided over similar cases and I can give you some guidelines as to what a jury may, how they may hear that case or how a judge similarly situated may hear that case. Uh -huh. This is where you're going to have the parties in separate rooms. And so, you know, again, maybe you start out in a, as a facilitative mediator, that the parties are all together and we're working on um, coming together and encourage the mediators, encouraging uh, thoughtful uh, alternatives to, to settle. But maybe there there comes a point where a party wants to speak with the mediator individually, and the mediator puts them in uh, individual caucuses, uh, individual rooms, and then becomes more evaluative. I don't think that there's a right or a wrong style. It is, but you've got to do both um, whenever you're mediating ethically within the bounds and, and ensuring that the parties are heard and that you are um, acting as a neutral. So I talk a lot, especially in the evaluative in caucus, talking about risk and reward. So this is a, a different way of looking at what's going to happen if this case doesn't settle today. What's the risk to you if you don't accept this offer? What's the risk to you if you do accept this offer, right? And so having this conversation with balancing the risk of not accepting it versus the reward of walking today. And a lot of times, especially when we are uh, now have, have a backlog due to COVID, uh, had a backlog even before COVID hit, that a reward today could be that the check, you could have a check in the mail or versus the risk of an unknown amount, an unknown resolution two to three years in the future. And so having the client really think about risk, um, you know, and cost the reward. What is the risk to that person if he or she does not accept that? So this comes back sometimes to a combination of facilitating that settlement, but also then the mediator putting him or herself in, in an evaluative position. It's based upon my experience a jury verdict in this type of case over a million dollars is probably 5% of the time. And having counsel work and understand what risk and reward and percentages means also helps. So I pulled your mediation uh, bill from 2021 that was proposed and all of those things were talked about um, that we've talked about today. So um, I just wanted to highlight uh, those. I uh, volunteer at a community, community mediation center and I do find that that is really, really a benefit. So I was pleased to see that in, as part of the uh, bill. Uh, our next session is uh, next week. And we'll talk about, again, um, using mediation to avoid costs associated with litigation, uh, to avoid delays in litigation, and how mediation really does, especially utilizing a community approach, 
uh, really does give access to justice for those who normally would not be able to receive justice. And then what this concept of a multi door courthouse looks like. That's my email. Um, again, this was a great session. I loved the questions and um, I look forward to being back with you next week. But I'd also like for you to send me an email. Let me know how you think things are going or if I need to cover something or if you're like, Speed up. I want to hear something new. Just let me let me know um, because again, I want this session to be as informative for you um, as it is for me putting it together. I just I'm looking forward every every time I, I know that I have a session, even though it's super early. I'm excited um, to talk about this. I I, I just think um, you know I've been I've tried cases as as a prosecutor as a defense attorney uh, and watched so many trials as a judge presided over them and I just really feel that ADR any form is so much help uh, and so beneficial to the parties because they get to help craft their resolution and they are helping to um, craft their own destiny, right? And so I think that's really important is that the parties get to have a say in what happens in their next chapter. So I'm, I'm here for a few more minutes if y'all would like to, if there's any more questions. Oh, my uh, great uh, group. Uh, as uh, my question is simple, ma'am, uh, ki as a judge mediator, what do you feel? Ki, do you feel that you pursue things differently than that of normal mediator? Uh, those who are there, who are not from, you know, the, who are not judges. So do you think you pursued certain thing in a different way or you had any kind of advantage over the other mediator? Mm, so that's a great question. Um, Actually, most, I hear that most um, parties, while they think they want to judge, um, they really don't um, because the judge is so used to making decisions. And it's really hard for a, a judge to step back and um, be in that facilitative role to help the parties reach their own conclusions because it's never what I want, the mediator wants. It's what the parties want. And uh, so I think that judges, just by our very nature, we're used to making decisions. Um, it's, it's hard to do that. What I do think is what I bring um, that is a benefit is I've had, you know, I tried so many cases as a judge presided over them and I was able to watch the jury as they made the decision that I can bring that experience and say, well, I don't know that um, that piece of evidence may get in to, uh, to the trial. I don't know that um, that's a viable defense that you're going to be able to present in this jurisdiction. And that's what I believe is my value as a mediator. Um, along with that, ma'am, as we know, okay, mediation is, you know, it is alternate way of dispute resolution and it is a private mechanism that has been created and it should be decided by the parties how they are going to manage this affair. Do you think the law should be passed or we should be having any kind of legal framework that will tell parties that this is how you are going to enter into, into mediation. So I, I, again, I am a huge advocate of mediation. I think that just even as a practical sense, you can mediate more cases more expeditiously than you can trying cases. So just from a, a chronological standpoint, I think that um, mandating mediation is helpful. The studies around the world show that 
jurisdictions that mandate mediation have reduced significantly their ju judicial backlogs. It also evens the playing field. If everybody has to mediate, then everybody is going to mediate. And, uh, and then having a very, um, you know, a statutory construction of these are the rules that everybody knows, then there will be comfort in some of those things where if somebody is concerned, well, if I share this, then that's going to be used against me later in litigation. That if you have these really well defined rules and practices, it does help. All right. Then. Any other questions? Yeah, may I ask you, Christy, a question? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, how difficult is the transition from a regular litigator to a, a mediator? If somebody wants to have a transition in the career or their profession, is it difficult? What difficulties do they normally face? Uh, so I think some of the concerns is, um, you know, are you able, it takes a while to build a good mediation practice. Um, and so if that's what you want to do solely, then um, finance, it could be a financial concern. Um, I think that some of us like that fast paced drama. And so being a litigator does um, satisfy that. But I think there, to me, being a mediator, you're really utilizing everything that the law is about, right? You're, you have to know what the law is in order to effectuate a good settlement uh, and resolution for your client. So you're, but you're using the law in, in, in a way that doesn't harm your client, where sometimes I feel litigation does. Um, even, you know, even when a client on paper wins, the the emotional and physical cost to get there so, sometimes significantly outweigh. And I've seen cases where uh, both sides have lost and walked away at, at, after a court court case. Um, and so the the concept of mediation done ethically and um, is is really a wonderful profession in, in my opinion. Um, I think that there's that mentality of win at all costs and it's hard for litigators to step back from that. But I think uh, you know, we are all mediating, even if we're not in a mediation. Those of us who, are, who have spouses, significant others, we are negotiating and mediating conflict every day. Those of us who have children are negotiating and mediating conflicts every day. And being able to do that as a profession, I, I really, I love every time I go into a mediation. I really have just enjoyed, and I've done it all, right? I've done all types of litigation, um, tried cases, presided over cases. I've arb I arbitrate and mediate, but I do love mediation because putting that power back into the hands of somebody who didn't have the power um, is really satisfying as well. Okay, I hope that answers that question. So <laughs> yeah, do you think, thank you so much. Yeah. Do you have concerns? What What are some of your concerns about not litigating I, and only mediating? Uh, in litigating, I normally feel we represent one of the parties, but in mediation, you need to be neutral and uh, Sometimes this crops up, you know, that you know what the uh, opponent is going to say and you know the uh, things very clearly or maybe beforehand. So it's difficult to uh, control the opponent at times and uh, or, you know, have that control over the parties and you tend to get uh, biased at sight towards one of the parties knowing that, okay, he's he or she is more on the fair side and he's not so 
on the right side so that thing sometimes at the initial stage do come in your mind when you know at your back of your mind that okay who are, we can judge sometimes from the facts and the consequences or the confidentiality spoken to during mediation that uh, maybe he is wrong or she is wrong so it times becomes difficult to be you know absolutely neutral and so that that's just a mind shift right so how getting into that mind shift of it's not the parties it's this problem that we're attacking the problem instead of attacking the party and so just again reframing that issue and it's just a it's a slight shift and um so that's that's the biggest probably the biggest challenge but i have no doubt you can do it thank you so much thank you for so that. so uh, i mean uh, uh, mediation in short is about harmony it is about win win situation it is about peace prosperity and progress for all the parties is it so um I think that sometimes it is um, because sometimes the parties are able to do that. Sometimes it is what I call a business decision that maybe the parties are settling because it's in their best interest to do so. It doesn't make them peaceful. It doesn't make them happy, but they know that settlement today is better and less risky than waiting for the alternative. Thank you. Hi, Gesti, this is Lal. Can I ask a question? Yes, how are you today? I'm great, Gesti. Thanks. How are you? Good. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> it's a nice, it's, it's a really a nice session. I have a query, uh, Christy like when we have we don't the heart of the litigator as uh, uh, one of our colleagues just mentioned what is that subtle part which the person who's acting as a litigator should keep in mind when he acts one as a litigator second if he gets to act as an arbitrator or a mediator or a counselor uh, conciliator so i think when you have the heart of a litigator and you want to be a mediator, that the easiest way to do that is, again, you're attacking the problem. Let's let's fight to get the solution instead of let's fighting the problem or, or fighting the person. And so when you, again, I think the, the litigator mm -hmm. in all of us uh, loves that drama and the and that exhilaration of the win you can get all of those things by winning at coming up with a resolution for the parties that they have have worked hard and um, and voluntarily come up with did that answer your question I, I partially yes uh, the one more okay. follow-up question on that is when you have don the hat of a litigator, as my colleague previously said the same thing, that when you know at the back of your mind or when you know the answer which the other party is going to give, because litigation is a mostly a reactive process on one side has to be right, other side has to be wrong. Whereas the uh, problem solving process is in the mediation part. And in conciliator, conciliator can suggest and solution also where mediation tries to find out the solution from the party's mouth by a long term uh, long term solutions or long term relationship so in that case uh, what can you share your experiences on how how it can it can be done or how you have done it so i'm i'm not quite sure i understand all your questions but i'm going to take a take a try um because what I what I think I'm hearing you ask is what happens when you know as the mediator what the best answer what the what the result should be, 
and the parties don't get there. Is that what you're asking? Mm, yes. Okay. So I see that a lot of times, right? Back to that example where the plaintiff said, we want a million dollars, and the defense attorney says, I want five dollars. Um, and you know, as a mediator, because you you are keeping well versed on the law and trends in the in litigation and mediation, you know that the likelihood of that particular case reaching that particular settle or verdict in front of a jury or a judge or whomever is is likely never going to happen. Small percentage, and then you know that you know you've worked through the mediation to get a settlement where you think is a window that is a reward not a risk um, and they don't want that there this is where you know when i went through like what when do you call an impasse there are times that i you know have have done everything that I've known how to do as a mediator. Um, all those things that I talked about and things we'll talk about in ex upcoming sessions and the parties, again, because they're voluntary, I cannot force them, even though I know this is in their best interest. Um, so, you know, the, you have to, as a mediator, step back from attachment to that outcome. And again, as a mediator, you're in control of the process. So at the end of the mediation, I always do a self-evaluation and say, did I conduct a process? Did I conduct this mediation in which both parties were valued, both parties were heard, and uh, that they had the opportunity to listen to both sides and evaluate their position for reasonableness. And if I can say all of those things, if I treated the parties with dignity and respect and, the, and there was not a settlement, that is not a failure on my part. That is just generally what a, what, happens. Not every case is going to settle at mediation. It does not mean that you as the process manager failed. It simply means that case was not ready for mediation or that the parties were not at that point ready. Um, I've had several cases, one recently that I, you know, they asked my opinion on what I thought would be a verdict uh, in in a county that I spent a lot of time as as a judge, and I told them, and um, the they said, well, that you'll the the verdict will never be that high, and so they they didn't settle, and um, they took it to court. And the the verdict came back at that exact dollar amount that I said. And so when um, so knowing that I did everything I could, that they were given all of those opportunities, then that's that's where I know I'm doing a good job. There were several times as as a litigator that I did everything right. And worked to, you know, worked hard, presented a good case, and for whatever reason, the jury decided differently. It's painful, but again, I think as a mediator, your role is the process and not the outcome. Let the parties own the outcome. You provide that space for them to get to that outcome, and. Um, you know, it's it's tough because we're all, as, as litigators, right, as lawyers, we're all successful and intelligent and type A. We, we want results. And so when, when there's not a conclusion, it's not as satisfying for you as a mediator. But again, you've got to, to step back and say, I'm not there just to get a settlement. I'm there to help the parties reach that settlement.
I hope that answered your question. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, thanks, Christy. Can, thanks can we have a, a what you call solution for a patents case in case of mediation? Can patents case can be resolved through mediation? One question. Second question is as a lawyer, if somebody approaches me, can I give a comparative analysis of litigation, arbitration, and mediation? Like litigation will take 10 years, mediation will take three months, litigation you will spend five lakhs. This also you will spend three lakhs. How many man hours you will spend in litigation? 30 days. How many hours, man hours you can spend in mediation? Three days. So is it possible to give a sort of a comparative estimate to a customer or a client? So I think your last question, um, do so I have, if if we've, we're getting kind of entrenched, I have the parties, you know, I'll look at the lawyer and I'll say, if this case doesn't settle today, what's the next step? Well, I've, you know, litigation is going to take this much money and all of that. So I will have, I do ask the, the client or the attorneys to in front of the client so that they know part of that, the risk, right? So that's in that scale. Um, so having an understanding of what comes next is really important for the clients and, um, did that answer that part of the question? Yes. Yes. Okay. And if you could ask your first part one more time. Whether mediation can be used in case of a patent dispute, patent, patent, trademark, patent, industry. So, yeah, so um, I actually, um, so yes, the, the short answer is yes. Um, and the, again, you can have voluntary mediation even before the case is um, is filed in a court. So yes, those cases can or can be uh, utilized uh, successfully in, in mediation. Thank you. I was going to I was going to tell you I had one, and then I remembered it was a. No, it was a mediation. It was a mediation, and we did successfully uh, resolve it uh, in in mediation. So I was thinking it was a, uh, it had been an arbitration, but it was a mediation, um, and all the parties. You know, it was a long day, um, but the the party we we were able to do that. Yes. Thank you. Very great of you. Thank you. All right. So Thank I will see you on. Uh, so I uh, am leaving this Zoom and then I'm going to go uh, do a similar presentation in person uh, in my for my home uh, county bar. Uh, so I hope that they they are as kind to me as you you all have been. Um, but uh, so it'll be a day of mediation discussions for me. So again, it's a great day. Please, please uh, send me an email. Um, I love these questions, and um, that way I can, again, we can spur these interactive questions, and, and I can focus some some questions and some slides back for you. So thank you. You all thank have you a so wonderful much. weekend. I uh, hope everybody gets some rest and relaxation uh, before our next session next week. Mr. Moore, I saw some chats where people wanted a copy of the PowerPoint, feel no, free. I will be to, sharing the same. I, will, uh, I have already sent a okay. uh, few of them and I will be sharing with them all the PPTs that okay, cool. I'm having right now. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, uh, for the time, I invite Ms. Atithi Abhay, Research Assistant at m Mumbai to propose a vote of thanks. All right. Have a great, Bye. great Bye. evening. Bye-bye. One -bye. second. Greetings to Maharashtra National Law University, Mumbai. It is my pleasure to extend a vote of thanks for today's session. I would like to thank our resource person, Ms. Christy Harrington, Madam, for methodically and precisely explaining the recent development in mediation and conciliation. I'm sure people will accept mediation as one of the easiest solutions for dispute resolution and our participants have jotted down the tips and tricks to ensure a successful mediation. 
I owe a big thanks to Advocate Shashidhar Nair, sir, the president of my of uh, family court bar family bar family court bar association for collaboration and organization of joint webinar with Maharashtra National Law University, Mumbai. I would like to thank and also mention a special thank to Honorable Professor Dr. Dilip Oke, Vice Chancellor and Professor Dr. Anirji Vardir, Registrar, Maharashtra National Law University, Mumbai, for motivating us to conduct such informative webinars. I would sound wrong if I don't owe a thank to Mr. Abhijit More for moderating the session with great enthusiasm. And a big thank you to all the participants for being so patient and cooperative. With the permission of the chair, I declare the closure of the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Antiji.